the world and made an effort to set in motion the church which would be commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What kind of people does God use? Tonight, my topic is the Holy Spirit wants to use you. And uh, I'll be, I'll, I will show you in the scripture, it's absolutely the case. Question is, are we willing to be used by God? Some people talk about using their spiritual gifts. It's the Spirit using us, working through us, that gets the work done. What kind of people does God use? Well, He uses all kinds of people, and we move toward Easter and uh, the day of the year when more people are willing to come to church than any other time, it's a great time to invite folks to come. The story of a woman who moved into a new neighborhood, and she soon met one of the older residents on the street who happened to be a real go-getter neighbor. The older resident asked, Do you have salvation? Well, I know the woman said, but I sometimes bother by arthritis. She said, no, I mean, are you lost? The older resident asked, no, I'm not lost. I live right up the street. Well, tell me, said the older resident, are you ready for judgment day? It's coming real soon. It may be tomorrow or the next day. No, I'm not, replied the woman, and for goodness sakes, don't tell my husband about it, or he'll want to go both days. When we witness, we have to have a message to share and to make sure that we are communicating and speaking into the lives of people. And you can do that. I can do that. And God will use us to, to, uh, to do so. When you look back in uh, church history, I know years ago as a young pastor, I was reading about Dave Wilkerson and his experience after church on Sunday evening, watching TV and then getting convicted about that, finally sold his TV, put it on the market and said, if somebody buys it in 30 minutes, we're selling it. And somebody bought it. I think it was like 29 minutes. And they got rid of the TV and he would spend his time in prayer. And that was the beginning of the birthing of uh, Teen Challenge. And it was just an ordinary person. D.L. Moody was a shoemaker. And uh, if you read about the life of Moody, one of, the, of America's most famous evangelists in the 19th century, the founder of YMCA and YWCA, but did a great work for God, but was a shoemaker. And I think about uh, the father of modern missions, the name escapes me, but it seems like he was a cobbler as well. And yet had a burden, had a map on the uh, wall of his shop. And he had, had flags in there, places where that no gospel had ever gone. And was preaching uh, one time for his church and challenging them to go. And when he got through, they dismissed the service. And he stood up and said, wait a minute, what are we going to do about a lost world? And modern missions was born. God uses ordinary people. In fact, the Bible says that God delights in taking that which is weak and doing something great through it. Because when, when God uses a person that isn't... Uh, notoriety. People know that's not them. It's the Lord that is getting the work done. And he wants to use us. And this is, we're looking toward great opportunity to be used by God. How do, the, how do people come to love the world, to have a burden for lost people? Well, I believe there are three clear phases in the scripture that Jesus uh, shows us in his training of the twelve and working with his disciples. 
three clear phases that Christ takes us through. Preparing. Phase that I, I love very much is called the discovery phase. I've used this term many times. John chapter 1, verse 36 through 42. When uh, John the Baptist was standing, it says in verse 35, the next day he was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Let me just point out a couple of things there. John was at his post of duty when Christ came by. And he didn't preach a message. He just said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, only one is named. That's Andrew, Peter's brother. The other one is thought to be John. It's my understanding, I believe that I'm correct, that John never mentions his name in the book that he wrote. He will call himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, but he will never mention his name. He's a very humble man and did a great work for God. But he had so prepared his followers, his disciples, that when Jesus passed and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, they immediately left John and began to follow Jesus. And uh, Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi or teacher, where are you staying? Surely. So they came and saw where he was staying. He said, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, about an, uh, for it was about the tenth hour, four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The first found his own brother, Sam, uh, Simon, and said to him, We have found him. We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. This event of, that uh, initiated their relationship with Christ, discovery phase, when we discover who he is, discover his mission and his heart. God has a heart. For people. He has a heart for young people. He has a heart for older people. There's no one that's outside of his gaze. He has a heart to reach all, no matter what nationality, no matter what our social strata may be, no matter what our education is, no matter what our accomplishments are. God has a heart for people. And he has a heart for all people to come and know. Because Peter said, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Death isn't the worst thing that can happen to us. The worst thing that can happen is death without Jesus. For that's eternal. To, be, to, to go by way of death means we've stepped into another world. But to die without Christ means there's no hope for us. And so Jesus has a heart for people. And somehow that has to be conveyed to us. How many pastors over the years have made the statement, I could do well if it wasn't for the people. And how crazy that is. You know, I've decided to speak up and just let it be known. Don't criticize the church to me. Look in the mirror. We are the church. And let's be what God wants us to be. Amen? Is this too strong for you? I'll get a little pablum out if it is. Oh, no. Okay, let's get it stronger then. 
But let's, let's, not, let's not be looking around at the faults of others when we have a telephone pole in our own eye. Amen. I thank God for the church, always have thanked God for the church, and always will love the church. Jesus loved the church, but he loves the world as well. And to discover the heart of, a, of our master and begin to love as he loves is the, is the key to reaching our world for Christ. John introducing those disciples and they followed him and when Jesus turned and said, what are you seeking? That was a positive winning question. It's his first public utterance in the book of John. What are you seeking? What are you running after? That's a good question for us to answer. And their answer is, is almost, uh, it just doesn't seem to fit, but it does. Where are you staying? They said. It seems so strange to, to answer his question with another. Where are you staying? And what they were saying is this. What we are seeking, we can't talk to you about here on the street corner. But we need to get alone with you and spend time with you and bear our hearts with you and let you know what's inside of us and the burden of our heart. We want to know who you are because they'd heard John's words and uh, Andrew said, we found the Messiah. Where are you staying? He said, come and see. And that was an invitation for him to come and, and them to come and spend an afternoon with the master. Now this made an indelible impre uh, impression on John's heart. Because as John wrote his book, he could actually remember the exact time he first encountered Christ. And I don't, I don't know if you have that kind of an experience or not. If it was just gliding into the kingdom without any fanfare on your part, or if it was like mine, it's like yesterday. I still hear his words in my heart. And this is what John said in his book. That which he has spoken before and the inference is I still hear those words reverberating in my spirit and in my soul today. And that encounter with Christ was a life change. And they, John said, Andrew said, we, we, we need to spend time with you. We want to have, have private time with you. Come and see, he said. And Simon, Peter's brother, Andrew, the Bible says, first went and found his brother and said, we have found him. Are you that definite about who Christ is today and about what he will do in your life? We have found him, the one whom we have searched for all of our life. We have found him. Come, you must come and see. And you find the discovery of who Jesus is. What a thrilling journey it is in your walk with God to start with that initial experience. That's all it is. That entrance into the kingdom. And then you begin to walk the journey and more and more you become acquainted with who he is, how he thinks, and what he desires. And you're able to bring your life into conformity with his life. What a marvelous and great experience it is. Andrew's words to Peter, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Those are some of the Greatest words in the New Testament, that little line. He brought him to Jesus. That's what our life is all about. 
That's what the church is all about, is bringing people to Jesus Christ. And we may do a lot of things, but nothing ever takes the place of our real mission. And that mission is to bring others to Christ and introduce them to Him. That's why we live and breathe and give and work and study and pray is to be able to be sensitive to the Spirit. Jesus fixed his eyes on Simon. I have a feeling that those eyes are different than any eyes we've ever looked into. Penetrating, looking right through him. And he said, you are Simon, son of John, but you shall be called Peter, a stone or rock. The sense of this message to Peter is this. You are not what I have created you to be. And in your present condition, you can never be what you were created to be. I haven't created you to grovel along. I've created you to soar in the spiritual realm and to know what it is to be used of God and anointed of the Holy Spirit, and to speak the word with power, and see multitudes come into the kingdom. But you're not him yet, but you will be. Aren't you glad he doesn't look at our failures, and our faults, and our weaknesses, and who we aren't, but he looks at us and says, yes, this is who you will become. That's my Lord. And that encounter with Peter, life change. You must change, Peter, your nature. Simon was known for his lack of firmness, his lack of stability, his inability to really stay the course, his impetuance. Peter was Famous for the hoof and mouth disease. Open mouth, insert foot. And he did it over and over, even with a master. But there was inside of Christ a picture of a man who one day would be molded and made and transformed and deployed into the work of the ministry. And he never lets up. He who hath begun a good work in you will also perform it until the day. I'm glad to tell you, you will give up maybe. He will never give up because he stays the course. I read an article this morning about the the suicide rate in America. And what is happening is we put God out of our our culture. How the emptiness, and it's rampant. I read, you read the story of the two girls. One shot the other, then shot herself. A suicide pack. It's rampant across America. And there are other problems. The drug problems are exceeding heroin, hard drugs, because without God, Where do you find any comfort? Where do you find any help or peace without God? Alcohol is a huge issue in America. I read this past week that the millenniums, 21 to 34, drank a third of the wine that was drank in America last year. And it tells how many cases that included. We are looking in the wrong places. We have a message, church, but God has to raise us up to be a voice in this day. And it's not a ragtag business. It's becoming what Christ says we are. You know what amazes me? I read, I've read this scripture so many times where the Bible says God speaks of things that are not as though they are. Did you know that's true all the way through the Bible? 
He spoke about a promised land that they didn't even possess one inch in. But he spoke of it as theirs. Here, what is he talking about to Peter? Not tomorrow, but his future. And I've many times marveled how that in Acts chapter 9, God called Saul to be an apostle to the Gentiles before he ever opened the door in chapter 10. But as I got to looking all through the Bible, God sees us. We aren't there yet. But he speaks of those things as if they were already done. Because God is great. And we, we serve a mighty God. Amen. Thank you. I thank God for the amen corner. Keep them coming. You're not bothering me. It's like saying sick them to a bulldog. <laughs> amen. Somebody said, we want a new preacher. Well, just start saying amen. He'll preach himself to death. and You'll get one. That's the way you do it. Better than the other ways. Son of Jonah, you will be Cephas. You will be rock-like. You will be the picture of stability. You will be the one that stays the course. You will make it because I'm going to change your life. It was a prophecy of his future work and position of Peter in the history, in history as the apostle who above all others laid the foundations of the church among the Jews on the day of Pentecost and among the Gentiles by the conversion of Cornelius. He laid the foundation. At the right time, Jesus bestowed this name upon him, Matthew 16, 18. You know the story. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And there were all kinds of answers given. And then he said, well, who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter said, flesh and blood, Jesus said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, Peter, but my father who is in heaven. And you are, you are Peter, Cephas. And I give you the keys to the kingdom, keys of the kingdom, not to the kingdom, of the kingdom. Power. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I believe I don't believe it's on Peter that the church is built, but it's on his rock solid heaven revealed confession. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God. That's the that's a confession upon which the church will be built. And the gates of hell means a lot. It means, it means, I've heard all my life, it means that we're not waiting for the devil to give up. We're storming hell's gates. We're coming against the powers of darkness. But it means among that and other things, the church will never cease to exist. It will not be destroyed because Jesus said it. Peter got his commission before the rest. And with those keys opened the door on the day of Pentecost to the Jews. And then in the person of Cornelius, he was honored to do the same for the Gentiles. In the list of disciples, he's always listed first. First commission. First confession. He was the first in a lot of ways. Some he wished he hadn't have been. Why are you talking about Peter? Because really Andrew's the man I look at. He brought Peter to Christ. Because Andrew was Peter's older brother. And you know sometimes there's a little rivalry between kids and you have kids in the ministry and, and there's rivalry. Who's going to exceed the other? Or in any profession. But you see none of that with Andrew. 
No sense of competition on Andrew's part. No grief on Andrew's part that all of this is spoken over Peter. He found his place and he served his master. Peter completely overshadows Andrew. And yet, if there's no Andrew, there may be no Apostle Peter. Because it was Peter who went and got, or Andrew that went and got Peter and brought him to Christ. And when you bring someone to Christ, you're instrumental. To me, it's the greatest privilege we ever have. It's to be instrumental in bringing and helping someone come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. There's no thrill like it. There's no joy like it. If you're joyous, joyless, lead someone to the Lord. Go visit a shut-in. I walked into Gail Grasty's room this week and she began... and. She began to quote scripture and the whole time I was there. She was quoting one scripture after another and how that God was going to heal her and God's going to do this and God's going to do that. And I just listened and I thought, sometimes it does us good just to have simple childlike faith and say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Even if I didn't believe it, it's true. It's a wonderful thing, that discovery stage. I love that stage of, of my walk with God. But then there's the development stage, and that's when Jesus called the disciples to be with him. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, you'll find that story written, how that Jesus prayed all night before he chose his twelve. Out of his disciples, he chose 12. And if you read that carefully, here's what it says. He called them apostles. I like it. I like progress. And you see it in the Bible. Disciples, followers. John chapter 1. Now disciples becoming apostles. Sent out with authority to do what the master has done given them to do. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing to see a life that's progressing forward and becoming an instrument that God can use. And this is what we see when you read this, this, this uh, few verses. In those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called a zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And uh, here he is calling them to be with him because he wanted them to witness his work and watch him and go with him as he did his work. And so up until this time, they were a group of followers interested in attaching themselves to the teacher, Jesus. But now they are, are apostles. And from among those, Jesus to chose his 12, and Luke alone tells us, Gave them the designation apostles. Peter or Luke had a real respect for apostolic authority. And that's one of the reasons that, that he records these things. Most interpreters believe, or many, that the number 12 corresponded with the number of the tribes of Israel, indicating a new people of God was coming into existence. You see, the church isn't Israel, except in a spiritual sense. There's a difference between Judaism and Christianity. And Christianity is a new creation, a new people that God is calling out 
to be his, his disciples and his apostles now to take this message to the far-flung corners of the world, to, to, to be with him, to understand his thinking, his mind, and catch his spirit, to share his faith and passion, to reach the lost, to be with him to see what he saw, to feel what he felt, to hear what he heard, and then do what he did. And as they were together in, that, in, in John chapter 6, the multitude had been following the Lord and been uh, several days without food, and they were in a wilderness place, and someone said, send them away so they can go and buy some food. And Jesus said, you feed them. You feed them. You know the story. Well, Master, it would take so much money to buy all the food for these people to feed them a little bit. Simon, Peter's brother, Andrew, said there's a little boy here. He has five loaves and two fish. And he brought him to Jesus. I was reading, one author said, Simon was sort of like the manager of the, or Andrew, the manager of the group. We'll see in John chapter 12 when the Greeks came and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip, they told Philip. Philip told Andrew. Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And it seems like that Andrew had a special gift of, of, uh, directing and organizing and, and helping Christ with his, with his group. Some, there's been discoveries of books that have been written about him, some that have been destroyed. And in one, apparently, he made reference to the fact that Judas was stealing from the bag. Though the Bible doesn't say that, so we don't know for sure. But he never said anything. And he never did anything, but he was, a, he was the kind of competent man that would release the master to be about the business he needed to be doing. Here he had an Andrew in the background. Thank God for those kind of people. Thank God for those kind of people that make every ministry grow. It's not just the frontliners. It's those who are never seen. But they're there making it happen. And that's Andrew. And you have to respect Andrew. I know a, a personal friend of ours and of the family is on staff now at, uh, in uh, Lakeland teaching in the college. Earned a doctorate and all of this. And when they met Chris there, they were talking with Chris and was, was talking about him being Ken Owens' son. Here's what Chris said. I'm not known as Ken Owen's son anymore. Ken Owen is known as Chris's father. The shoe's on the other foot. You know, if you can applaud your disciple who outstrips you in what he does, that's a good thing. And what I say is go get them. Go and reach the lost. Go and win as many as you can. I'll be in your corner. I'll be praying for you. I'm for you. Win the lost. That's what it's all about. I've lost my distinction. I know when Kenny was in Bible college, he said one of his professors said, Ken Owen, Ken Owen, Ken Owen. I knew a guy with that name one time. Yes, I'm his son. They had to behave. Otherwise, I would know about it right away. Catching the mind of Christ. Spending, called to be with him. I'm called to that. I feel that call is definite as a call to salvation. 
He called me out of sin, but he said, come, I want you to be with me. I want you to walk with me. I want you to commune with me. I want us to be together, partner. I want you to work with me in the kingdom. I know what that call sounds like. It's a humbling call, not one you take on yourself. But God has called many. Many that will never be called reverend or stand behind a pulpit. But I, I get around them, I know them. They're called to spend time with Him. And that's what they, that's where their greatest enjoyment is found. You see, Andrew just continued to bring people to Jesus. The little boy with the lows. You know, I was preaching years and years ago from that passage and I'd been studying, trying to figure out when did the bread multiply and when did the fish multiply? Five little loaves, 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Two little fish. When did they multiply? And I remember standing, I was preaching a missions message out of that passage. You feed them. The world is hungry. You feed them. It's easier to give them a piece of bread sometimes than it is to give them what they really need. And that is the Lord. And I remember stepping in the pulpit that morning and I'm, I'm thinking, Lord, I, I feel so inadequate today. That I don't know that I can feed all of these people. I don't know that I have that in me. And it was like the Lord reminded me of the little boy with the fish and his bread. When you begin to pick it out, you don't diminish it. He puts more in and more in. And as you get it, there's more. And you keep giving out and you're thinking, where did that come from? That wasn't what I had ever even thought about. And you find yourself ministering and working. I was reading somewhere recently where the pastor was talking about his, uh, his ministry. I shared this with some of the staff, I think. but And he was preaching, and he felt like that he had his message, but he didn't start his message. And he started out with these words. I feel like there's someone here this morning. You've made a big mistake, and you're about to make a decision that's going to compound the error that you've already made. And God wants you to know that he has the answer for you and that he cares for you this morning. He went on and preached his message. That next week his phone rang and a young lady from a, a local college called. In her college experience, she had lost her walk with God. She was now pregnant. She was in that Sunday morning service. She was wrestling with whether to have an abortion or not. He led her to the Lord. Later on, she married the father of the child. And that, he said, has been 25 years ago. They are pillars in the church today. I'm telling you, there's manna in the bucket. There's a word from God that is on target and in tune with the need of someone you and I come across their path. And the only way you find that is when you have been with Jesus. Otherwise, we'll miss it. There's a supernatural element. It's not just giving information. It's tapping into the heart of God and becoming a conduit through which God's treasure begins to flow out of you and touches the hearts of others. And then finally, the third stage is the deployment. I love John chapter 20, verse 21 and to 23. Let me, let me say this, if you're turning with me or looking, if you're not, that's all right too. 
John is particularly kind to Andrew. I've never noticed that before. But it's very neat. Andrew was not the star, but he was a crucial component in the ministry of the Lord. And John mentions him, mentions him, the, the uh, Greeks, mentions him with a little boy, mentions him in chapter 1, mentions again uh, over and over as he gives the list. He, he has Andrew there. And here, this is a great commission. John chapter 20, 21. When they met the resurrected Christ, he said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. Even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus wasn't given to doing stuff as as just as a type. He was the fulfillment. And I believe that as he breathed on them, I believe that they're... They were born again. They became new creatures, indwelt by the Spirit of God. I said a while ago, when you see what he saw, you hear what he hears, you feel what he feels, you'll do what he does. You'll be his hand extended. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. This morning I was saying, Lord, you've given me the same anointing that you had, the same spirit, the same equipment. You haven't sent me out to work in my own strength. You've sent me out to do your work, to allow you to work through me. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Peter became the fisher of men in mass. Andrew was a fisher for individuals. There's something about individuals. My life turned around on one event. I knew that God was dealing with my heart and I couldn't really get a sense of God's will for my life. It was tough for me because I'm so hard-headed. And don't you say amen. Amen. But anyway, I was working up in Tidewater, Virginia, up in the historic section of the great state. And my boss, Bill Stamper was his name. He was about 39, 40 years old. And I'd driven all night, worked all day, and I came in that evening and I found out that Bill was sick. He, we stayed in motels. We traveled. I traveled a lot. In my, in my work and I went to Bill's room and went in and there he was propped up in the bed and uh, Bill I, I asked him if I'd get anything he wanted some kind of uh, juice I went and got it left it with him went to bed next morning got up went out on my calls and came back that evening I didn't think nothing I knocked on his door and a deputy sheriff opened the door He had died during the night. I did not know that he had had a massive heart attack. Been to the emergency room. They wanted to keep him. He refused to stay. And as I went, I was one of the pallbearers at his funeral. And at the funeral, I heard a pastor of a non-Pentecostal church of God, fundamental folks, said, this man has sat in my Sunday school class for the last six weeks and has wept every Sunday. That's when it dawned on me that working X number of hours to make X number of dollars to buy this or that or the other If that's all life is, it's not much. If 
what really haunted me was the best I witnessed to him was, Bill, when are you going to stop living like you're living? He was a wicked man. When are you going to turn to Christ? He was always respectful of me. But I wasn't close enough to know, to God perhaps, where he was, knowing that he had a heart ailment that would take him out. No one else in our company knew it, nobody. He didn't want to lose his job. It changed my life. I said, God, I do not want to live X number of years on this earth and come down to the end and all I can show is a house, a car, a little money in the bank and no nothing to present at your feet. I can't do that. I want my life to count for you. I'm not willing just to fill a position. I want to do something for the Lord. I don't want a title. I want to see souls saved. God knows how to, to, to get us. Andrew, history says, went to a certain island, was preaching, Patros, Greece. And they crucified him because the ruler didn't like what his message was. And they hung him on a cross. And he, he lingered there for three days. So the record says. He was tied to the cross with thick, tight ropes for three days. And his last words were, Accept me, O Christ Jesus, whom I saw, whom I love, and in whom I am. Accept my spirit in peace in your eternal realm. But the witnesses say as he hung there three whole days suffering dreadful pain, he continued to tell the people around him of the love of Jesus Christ. The people as they listened to him began to believe his words and asked the governor to let him be taken down from the cross. And because he wanted to please them, he allowed it. And when they loosed that last rope, he fell to the ground, dead. He was gone. Andrew was a hero. I've met many of them over the years. Never taught a class. Never stood behind a pulpit. Never in the limelight. But they were heroes of the faith. They've been pillars of the church. A pillar bears some weight. It's not just a fixture to adorn the place. There are three calls. The call to follow. Discovering. The call to be with him. And the call to go for him. This morning, I hope and pray. That's my prayer. Because I have had assurance. My message will not cause you to do that. It may stir you up for a moment. But as I was thinking, Lord, I, I can't put that in the hearts of men. I sensed the Lord saying, no, but I can. And I will. I will put it in their hearts. And so this morning, I'm asking you a question. Do you hear him calling? Is he calling you out of the life of lethargy or comfort where you are? And saying, there's a work I created you to do. And it's time for you to become what I said you are created to be. So you can do what I've created you to do. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. Lord, I love you and I thank you. I thank you, Lord. It's a great, great, great privilege. It's a great privilege to serve you, to be a part of 
what you're doing in this last day. For every missionary that we help get to the field, there's joy. For every church that they build, we rejoice. For every soul that is saved, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you that we can be involved in something like this around the world. Lord, we bless you. We think about the Johnsons in Nepal. Lord, just normal people who said it's not right. The gospel hadn't gone any further than this. That can't be. We must take it further. And the Bible is replete with those who were never, never the star. But oh, what servants they were. And today I believe that you're speaking to a people in this room. You're calling out a people that says to them, Lord, the Lord is calling for you to be his mouthpiece, to go. Not to leave your job or your house or your family, but to be one of those who will take his name wherever you go. And there may be those, Lord, that you're speaking to as far as what their life's work should be. There's no better place than the will of God. No safer place than your will. Today we ask you, 